Good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry for rushing you through lunch, but our guest this afternoon is an admiral who runs a very tight ship. He has a very tight schedule, and uh, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the afternoon, Admiral Harry Harris, Chief of US PACOM, the Pacific Command, uh, and a man much in the news in the past few days. Uh, without much ado, Admiral, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Ashok, for that introduction and for moderating a few questions uh, afterward. So good afternoon, folks, and thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge Your Excellencies, uh, Minister Sawaj and Foreign Minister Jai Shankar, who have organized this flagship event in India. And a special uh, thank you to the Observer Research Foundation uh, for hosting the inaugural Rosina Dialogue and bringing together leaders and experts from diverse backgrounds. I know the Rosina Dialogue is envisioned to be India's flagship conference of geopolitics and geoeconomics, and predicated on India's vital role not only in the Indian Ocean, uh, but the greater Indo-Asia Pacific region. I believe you all are off to a wonderful start. So I'm deeply honored to be at this venue to discuss ways to make this region a more prosperous and thriving part of the world. So I've just got to say up front, it's always great to visit India. This is my second trip here in as many years. My first came way back in 1995 when I commanded a P-3 squadron and participated in one of the early Malabar exercises. We operated out of Trivandrum and Cochin down south. I also visited India in 2012 uh, as part of former Secretary of State Clinton's team. With each visit, I became more attached to the Indian people that I admire greatly, your culture that I respect deeply, and of course, the cuisine. Oh, the cuisine, it's wonderful here, thank you. Uh, this certainly seems to be the case for all of my U.S. component commanders. As we like to say, the PACOM, or Pacific Command Area Responsibility, stretches from Hollywood to Bollywood. But I had no idea how seriously my commanders took this phrase. Every time I try to get one of them to see me at my headquarters in Hawaii, it seems they're unavailable because they're here in India. So I'm glad I'm the one who's unavailable back in Hawaii so that I could join you here. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am about America's growing relationship with India, which I've made a priority line of effort at PACOM. As the world's two largest democracies, we are uniquely poised to help bring greater security and prosperity to the entire region. And I think that's primarily because two visionary policies are now coinciding at the perfect time. Initiated two years ago by Prime Minister Modi, India is implementing your Act East policy. At the same time, the United States is conducting our strategic balance, strategic rebalance west uh, to the Indo-Asia Pacific. You need look no further than last month's, or last October's Malabar maritime exercise between India, Japan, and the United States to see the security interconnectedness of the Indian Ocean, Asia, and Pacific Ocean regions. An important component of these policies involves leadership engagement. So it was great to see President Obama visit New Delhi last year to discuss the strengthening of ties between our great nations. During that visit, I was struck by something that Prime Minister Modi said, quote, this is a natural global partnership. It has become even more relevant in the digital age. It is needed even more in our world for far-reaching changes and widespread turmoil. The success of this partnership is important for our progress and for advancing peace, stability, and prosperity around the world." Unquote. Those prophetic words set the tone for my remarks today. Being from a small southern town in the United States, I'm certainly not as eloquent as your Prime Minister. So if you can understand my Tennessee accent, I'll simply say, Chalene Sat Sat, forward, together we go. And in my opinion, we can go forward together fast enough. That's why I was pleased that last year, Prime Minister Modi and President Obama outlined the U.S.-India Joint Strategic Vision. I believe this is a true indicator of the potential that exists between our two nations. Together, we can develop a roadmap that leverages our respective efforts to improve the security architecture and strengthen regional dialogues. Together, we can ensure free and open sea lanes of communication that are critical for global trade and prosperity. 
This is a pillar of the international and inclusive rules-based global order and a principle upon which we cannot waver. So for the next few minutes, <clears throat> let's be ambitious together and consider how, how we might realize the security aspects of the Joint Strategic Vision by identifying some actions that we can take to advance our special relationship. I'll begin by recognizing that India's historical and cultural influence extends from Southeast Asia to Mongolia and from Indonesia to the steppes of Central Asia and to the United States, where approximately three and a half million Americans of Indian descent live and thrive. India is an important fabric in the American tapestry. But I also believe that India is a critical part of PACOM's tapestry. I'm sometimes asked why I always use the term Indo-Asia Pacific versus the commonly used term Asia Pacific by smart people like those in the room today. My answer is simple. Indo-Asia Pacific more accurately captures the fact that the Indian and Pacific Oceans are the economic lifeblood that links India, Australia, Asia, Oceania, and the United States together. Strengthening that economic connective tissue through security and diplomatic partnership is what America's rebalance is all about. Expanding cooperation with India will not only be the defining partnership for the rebalance, it will arguably be the defining partnership for America in the 21st century. Let's be ambitious together. On the security front, India is beginning to exert its leadership in the Indo-Asia Pacific. We are ready for you. We need you. Let's be ambitious together. Now, I'm clear-eyed and perhaps a bit moonstruck by the opportunities a strategic partner with India represents. I'm also just as clear-eyed about the threats in the region. There are significant security challenges that no one country is capable of solving alone. For example, by 2050, it's expected that seven out of every 10 people who walk this planet will live in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. This level of population and urbanization will present special challenges in regard to the demand for food, for energy, for housing, and importantly, for freedoms. While these challenges will test the global community in the coming years, they are not insurmountable. While there is much to do, much has already been done to ensure a peaceful and prosperous future for the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Last year, India hosted Japan and Australia for its first ever high-level trilateral dialogue here in New Delhi. Some of the topics discussed were maritime security, including freedom of navigation patrols and trilateral cooperation in the Indo-Asia in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. An idea to consider is perhaps expanding this trilateral to a quadrilateral venue between India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. We are all united in supporting the international rules-based order that has kept peace and, and is essential to all of us. The India-US strategic vision charges New Delhi and Washington to, de to develop a roadmap together to leverage our respective efforts to improve the security architecture, and strengthen regional dialogues. Additionally, Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Abe signed the Japan and India Vision 2025 for a special strategic and global partnership. One week later, Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Turnbull had similar discussions in Tokyo where both voiced opposition to coercive actions in the South and East China Seas. Hearty support for America's rebalanced policy and recognition of the challenges of nuclear proliferation, North Korea, and terrorism. This is ambition in action. It ensures the vision of our country's leaders by strengthening military to military collaboration, and in the process, it will improve security and prosperity of the entire region. We must also continue to encourage robust senior defense and leadership dialogues like the one held last year between U.S. Defense Secretary Carter and Indian Defense Minister Parikar. This meeting renewed a 10-year defense framework that helped put the U.S.-India security relationship on a fast track. Fast track is good because, in my opinion, all of us should be rushing to strengthen the U.S.-India relationship while helping India position itself as a global power and security partner of choice in this region. Another promising outcome of Prime Minister, of Prime Minister Parikar of, uh, Prime Minister Modi's eight-day visit to Washington was an agreement for a series of joint India-U.S. exercises 
scheduled to take place uh, this year. This is a kind of progress that is frankly stunning. We went from rarely talking to each other only a few years ago to not only talking together, but doing together. Skepticism, suspicion, and doubt on both sides have been replaced by cooperation, dialogue, and trust. Secretary Carter will visit India next month for the second time in the past year, as will Under Secretary Kendall. Both of them have spent many years strengthening bilateral ties that have helped lay the groundwork for the defense framework. We're all appreciative of how they have both led from the front. Speaking of robust senior leadership engagements, our Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson, told me about his recent visit to New Delhi and was amazed at what he saw during the Viscompotinum International Fleet Review. He was proud to be one of the 50 countries with visiting warships to join a number of heads of navies from around the world to celebrate your fleet review. Our crews from the USS Antietam and USS McCampbell will never forget the hospitality uh, they received in Vizag. Our CNO is only one of many U.S. Joint Military leaders working closely with their Indian counterparts. In fact, nearly a dozen flag and general officers from the Pacific region have visited India in, uh, in just the past two months. At every level, this, rela this relationship flourishes and is strengthened by senior leadership visits, increased port visits, and exercises. This summer, India will join 27 nations during the Rim of the Pacific, or RIMPAC exercise as we call it. This is the world's largest international maritime exercise, and Admiral Scott Swift, who just visited India this January, looks forward to hosting everyone in Hawaii. India will also participate in Red Flag 16, an advanced, an advanced aerial combat exercise hosted by the U.S. Air Force in Alaska. Exercising together will lead to operating together. By being ambitious, India, Japan, Australia, and the United States, and so many other like-minded nations can aspire to operate anywhere on the high seas and the airspace above them. The idea of safeguarding freedom of the seas and access to international waters and airspace is not something new for us to ponder. This is a principle based upon the international rules-based global order that has served this region so well. And for decades, the United States has conducted freedom of navigation patrols, or FONOPS, without incident. No nation should, should perceive FONOPS as a threat. U.S. Ambassador Verma recently spoke about Mare Libram, the Latin term for a free sea for everyone. Freedom of navigation on the high sea, seas and the airspace above them are not some abstract concept to be studied in academia. They're not privileges of rich and powerful countries. They're fundamental rights of all nations. While some countries seek to bully smaller nations through intimidation and coercion, I note with admiration India's example of peaceful resolution of disputes with your neighbors in the waters of the Indian Ocean. India indeed stands like a beacon on a hill, building a future on the power of ideas and not on castles of sand to threaten the rules-based architecture that has served all of us so well. That's why it's critical for India's powerful voice to be added to the chorus of like-minded nations in this increasingly complicated and interconnected world. As India takes a leading role as a world power, military operations with other nations will undoubtedly become routine. So I echo Ambassador Verma's vision that in the not too distant future, American and Indian Navy vessels steaming together will become a common and welcome sight throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific waters as we work together to maintain freedom of the seas for all nations. Considering the $5.3 trillion dollars in trade that traverses each year from the Indian Ocean and through the South China Sea, we all have a vested interest in ensure the entire region remains secure, stable, and prosperous. How Indo-Asia Pacific nations employ naval forces to support these economic interests matters greatly. And because of ventures like the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, or DTTI, prosperity for India and the United States is also enhanced. This initiative charts an exciting course for the India-US relationship, 
uh, and is in line with the Make in India campaign. It fosters technology cooperation, works to build industry uh, to industry ties, and identifies opportunities for co-development and co-production of defensive systems. This is truly a new brand of partnership for us and one unique to the U.S.-India relationship. We have overall overhauled our approach to defense licensing to India with a presumption of approval for the vast majority of sophisticated platforms. Our offers to provide Indian forces with Apache attack helicopters, the most advanced in the U.S. inventory, Chinook heavy lift helicopters, and M777 howitzers are akin to our defense relationships with our closest NATO allies. Last month, the Joint Aircraft Carrier Technology Working Group uh, met here in India and laid the groundwork to bring state-of-the-art uh, technology to India's indigenous carriers. This includes advanced launch and recovery equipment that will enable India to operate heavier planes from its carriers and ultimately increase your capacity to safeguard the maritime domain. I pledge my unwavering support to programs like DTTI uh, by providing subject matter experts, increased opportunities for joint training, and championing pilot programs tied to this joint endeavor. As we expand civil-military co collaboration, we should also explore building a strong cybersecurity infrastructure, especially as it relates to industrial control systems and smart cities. Our nation's construction coalition cyber exercises to explore how we can better protect critical infrastructure and industrial control systems where the threats are today not completely understood. I mentioned North Korea earlier, a belligerent nation, a notorious proliferator. Regional security requires that we be ambitious together in adopting a more proactive counterproliferation posture to put an end to WMD-related trafficking. And this means encouraging all like-minded nations to join the PSI or Proliferation Security Initiative. Finally, the last ambitious action that I will mention today is a need for cooperative responses to natural disasters such as earthquakes and tsunamis. And as Ambassador Burma just said last month, the threat caused by rising sea levels represents an enduring challenge for this region. These ambitions will allow us to move forward together. With each engagement, U.S.-India defense ties grow stronger. And we are stronger together. Our two nations share a vision for a partnership in which India and the United States work together, not just for the benefit of both countries, but for the benefit of the entire region by supporting an open and inclusive rules-based global order based on international law. The United States and India have committed to expanding our strategic partnership in order to harness the inherent potential of our two great democracies and the growing ties between our peoples, our economies, and our governments. As both countries work toward a common future, this is a relationship that will be critical in strengthening the Indo-Asia Pacific security architecture so that everyone can continue to develop and prosper. By virtue of India's geography and history, it must chart its own path on the world stage. But I think Prime Minister Modi has it right in saying that, quote, our destinies are linked by the currents of the Indian Ocean, unquote. So ladies and gentlemen, let's be ambitious together and create a model of strategic partnership for the rest of the world to emulate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, we have time for a few questions. I'll use my prerogative as the chairperson, as the moderator, to ask the first. Uh, I'd like to refer, Admiral, to uh, some remarks you made before the U.S. Congress uh, recently on an issue that has led to much debate in India, uh, the sale of uh, F-16s by the U.S. to Pakistan. Does this uh, harm or hinder or help regional security? Your thoughts? Okay, I'm out. Yeah, okay, I'm out. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ashaka, this did come up uh, during my uh, testimony uh, period uh, last week uh, in Washington, and, and I recognize uh, India's uh, discomfort with the F-16 sale. Uh, but I can say truthfully 
that the United States does not view its security relationships uh, in this region and, quite frankly, globally in zero-sum terms. Our relationships with India, uh, Pakistan, uh, Australia, Japan, and, and every other country stand uh, on their own merits. And as I repeatedly said, uh, I'm excited uh, with our growing relationship with India, not just in the defense re uh, realm, uh, but uh, across the, the scale, ac across the, uh, the whole uh, litany of opportunities uh, between our governments uh, and between our peoples. Uh, U.S. Ambassador Verma, I believe, has done a spectacular job uh, enhancing our bilateral relationship, uh, and I'm doing all I can uh, to grow uh, the security uh, aspects uh, of that relationship. So you have a second career as a diplomat. <laughs> uh, Dina Karan no, Perry, no. <laughs> you have a question there, if you could. Admiral Harris, here. Where? To your left. At the mic there. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, could you comment on how the U.S. can help from the Army and Air Force perspective related to regional security, and also just briefly elaborate on the comment on joint patrols which you touched upon? Uh, I missed the last part of your question. Uh, no. Can you also elaborate on the issue of joint patrols which you touched upon in your talk? Thank you. Okay, so the, the first part of the question dealt with uh, the Army and Air Force relationships and how we can be helpful. Uh, I think there are a number of ways to do that. So let me point out uh, the obvious fact. Uh, I'm a naval officer, but in, in command of Pacific Command, that's a joint command. So I'm a joint officer. So if you have uh, colored glasses, please put them on and pretend like I'm wearing a purple uniform uh, because I'm a joint officer. There are a number of ways uh, that the United States Pacific Command uh, uh, works uh, closely with the Indian uh, Army and Indian Air Force. Uh, U.S. Army Pacific, uh, led by General uh, Vince Brooks, uh, is involved in a, a major exercise uh, called Yuda Abbas. Uh, the uh, uh, Lori Robinson, uh, the uh, General Lori Robinson, she's the commander of Pacific Air Forces, uh, is, has, has been here recently uh, and will host uh, Red Flag uh, uh, 16 that I spoke about in my remarks. Uh, th this is an exciting operation exercise, which we haven't done in a long time uh, together, uh, where your uh, advanced fighter aircraft your C-17s, your IL-76s, uh, and your Jaguars uh, will, will travel all the way from here to Alaska and participate in high-end war, war fighting training and exercises. This is not low-end basic stuff, neither Yuta Abbas uh, or uh, uh, a red flag. These are high-end, complicated uh, 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 exercise scenarios, and that's how we improve that relationship, uh, and, as well as uh, your uh, uh, Vajra uh, Parker Special Operations uh, exercises with uh, U.S. Special Operations Command Pacific. You know, th these are, again, I, I want to emphasize the complicated nature, the com complexities that are resident in these exercises, uh, which serves not only to benefit uh, your armed forces, but serves to ben benefit uh, Pacific Command uh, forces as well. So I'm excited about all of that. Uh, regarding the question on, on joint patrols, uh, uh, the ambassador here, our ambassador, uh, and I have advocated uh, working together. I spoke about working together because uh, you have, India has, uh, an advanced uh, military uh, across all the domains, uh, on the ground domain, the air domain, and the maritime domain. Uh, and we exercise together uh, on the, in the maritime spaces, uh, just like uh, I spoke about uh, uh, Yudha Abbas and... Uh, 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 red flag. These are complicated scenarios. Y your Navy has, is long uh, in history and steeped in, in uh, capability on the high seas. You have modern ships, modern weaponry, modern submarines, modern naval aircraft and helicopters and all of that. So uh, we should be uh, exercising together, then we should turn those exercises uh, into uh, coordinated operations. And where we do those operations, whether we do them in the in the Indian Ocean, in the, in the northern part of the Indian Ocean, uh, the eastern part, or even in the Pacific. Uh, that's up, up to our leaders to decide that, uh, and then wherever that opportunity presents itself, 
uh, Pacific Command's maritime forces, that would be United States Pacific Fleet uh, and uh, United States Seventh Fleet, uh, will stand ready to, to work with you on that. We have fine time for one final question. Uh, Sylvia Mishra from the URF, a young researcher on Indo-US relations. Admiral Harry Harris, uh, my question to you is, uh, you've been quoted and also you've mentioned in your remarks about the growing complexities and challenges in freedom of navigation operations. Uh, I want to know how would you comment on the future of Malabar exercises in the backdrop of these growing complexities? Thank you. Okay, so uh, a great question and thank you for it. Uh, Malabar uh, has been a cornerstone of, of my personal experience uh, with India. Uh, as I said in, in my, uh, uh, my remarks, I first, operate, I first visited India because of Malabar in, uh, uh, in, in 1995. And, and uh, I'm a P-3 guy, that's an anti-submarine warfare aircraft, and we did an exercise with uh, 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 Indian submarines, uh, and I'll tell you what, the hardest submarine I've ever tried, and the emphasis on the word tried, uh, to track uh, was that Indian submarine uh, led by a young lieutenant commander uh, who I had the chance to meet at the, at the uh, uh, reception uh, at the end of the exercise, who I'd, I'd love to find out where he went, because uh, he, he was, it was quite challenging. Uh, and so that was my, my first uh, experience with Malabar. Uh, after that, uh, I commanded the, the P-3 wing uh, based in Japan. We were involved in Malabar, uh, and then uh, uh, as Pacific Fleet, uh, my forces were involved in Malabar, and then this year, coming up. So last year, Malabar, we had, the, I think, the USS Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group participated, uh, high-end war fighting. Uh, the year before that, uh, Malabar was in the, in the Pacific, uh, another example of high-end war fighting. So I'm very excited uh, about uh, Malabar 2016. I think it's going to be held uh, in the uh, northern part of the Philippine Sea. Uh, Japan is a participant. Uh, I think that by including uh, another high-end military uh, like Japan uh, in, in Malabar, uh, increases the complexity and allows uh, India and the United States to work with our uh, Japanese partners. So it, it's an important uh, element uh, in strengthening the maritime capabilities of all three countries. And, you know, and, and uh, I stand to learn from your Navy. Uh, I'll have the chance to, to pay a call on uh, Admiral Doan uh, later this afternoon after this, and I'm looking forward to that and looking forward to seeing him again. Uh, but we can learn from you uh, just like uh, you can learn from us and vice versa. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited by the complexity of Malabar, and I think that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, exercise translates into operations. By exercising together, we are more comfortable with operating together, uh, and, and that's the uh, and I think that, that uh, is what awaits all of us. So thank you very much for the question. 